From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Hey, well, okay. can, can oh, I jump in here? Oh, hey, on, hey, no, we have too many. The leading Democrats seeking Rhode Island's open congressional seat didn't hold back in our live primetime 12 News debate. In order to buy influence for their corporate clients, in, in Gabe's case, we're talking about Eli Lilly. Well, I'm not going to take the, the lecturing from folks who are supporting a candidate who has a $125,000 contribution from his father-in-law to a super bad pack. Aaron Regenberg is now the widely acknowledged frontrunner in the Democratic primary, but he's facing strong competition from Gabe Amo, Sandra Cano, and Sabina Matos. Is the race headed for a photo finish on Tuesday night? We recap the big debate and look ahead to primary day this week on Newsmakers. Welcome to this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, joined by 12 News politics editor Ted Nisi and also 12 News political analyst Joe Fleming. And as I said on Tuesday, 12 News hosted the only live primetime debate in this congressional race with Democratic candidates looking to replace former Congressman David Cicilline. Today on Newsmakers, key moments from that debate and some astute analysis, as <laughs> oh, always. We'll do uh, our best. <laughs> Ted, fellow co-moderator, uh, what was your take away from the debate? Well, Aaron Regenberg is clearly, everyone thinks he's the front runner. He was under kind of coordinated assault mm. for portions of this debate, which, uh, you know, there are ups and downs to that. Obviously, the downs are kind of clear. You're getting attacked. But I think it only strengthened people's sense that, like, all right, he's the man to beat. Yeah, Joe? No question. Uh, this debate show that everyone else believes that Aaron Regenberg is the front runner in this race, and they feel they have to bring him down some in order to win. The problem is, there's seven or eight other candidates to divide those votes up if you bring Aaron down. So he has a strong block of votes he's holding on to right now. Yeah, nobody believes that Aaron Regenberg is getting like 55% no. of the vote next week. Nope. Right. It's just that if, seven, if, you know, 10 right now other people are in the race, Twenty. you said it last week, Tim, 28% in that AMO poll, that's enough for Regenberg to win mm -hmm. if he gets it. So Regenberg came under attack very early on in right. the debate, and it was a question over the debt ceiling. Why don't we take a listen to that section? Final question in this section, and I believe I, I know where everyone stands on this, but for the, again, for the viewers at home, raise your hand if you would have voted for the debt ceiling deal last spring that prevented the country from going into default. Everyone but Mr. Regenberg is a yes on that one. And, and Mr. Regenberg, why don't we talk about this for a second? You, you've been a standout on, on this issue, and I'm curious, would you still have voted no if you were the deciding vote? In other words, if it would have killed the bill? Uh, absolutely. If, if the if the question we received was not how would you vote uh, if you were this, the deciding factor, in that case, obviously you have to vote yes. That wasn't the situation. The situation was that Kevin McCarthy took our economy hostage in order to push through dangerous Republican cuts to critical programs. Hang on. It was an up or down vote, Mr. Regenberg. Yes or no? Would you have voted for the debt ceiling bill? Yes, absolutely. If, it, if you're the deciding factor, absolutely. My position is the same position. Hang on one second. My position is the same position as that of Senator Elizabeth Warren, Ed Markey, John Fetterman, reps like Katie Porter and Barbara Lee, folks in leadership like Rosa DeLauro, and uh, even more moderate reps like Dan Goldman and Adriano Espiat. Mr. Amo, you want to weigh in? So Aaron has said that he would vote to take this country into catastrophic default. That is saying that he knows better than Jack Reed, Sheldon Whitehouse, David Cicilline, and Seth Magaziner. I would have voted to stand with Rhode Islanders, not vote against Rhode Islanders. This is not a time to play politics with people's economic outcomes. And for us, we need to think about the people that we represent. And let's think about a SNAP program, social security benefits for seniors. That is what it was in the line. He tweeted that we would have voted no on the debt ceiling. That's risky. And we have to think about the consequences that we're having as a country for having this fight over the debt ceiling over and over. I'm the other progressive on this stage but I would be very pragmatic on this issue. This is about putting people first. So ultimately, what was on the line was Social Security, Medicare, and that is just a very irresponsible position for Mr. Regenberg to take. We have people who are one check behind to become uh, lost their home. Then I think that it was very irresponsible for Mr. Aaron to say that he would vote no on We're, that decision. Uh, I'll get to you, Mr. Regenberg. We're going to wrap this up briefly for Mr. Casey and then Mr. Burbrick. Go. I think everybody's beat up Mr. Regenberg pretty well on this, but the issue, the issue is that it's completely irresponsible. It's like defaulting on your mortgage, just letting everything go. We, we wouldn't be able to to do anything here. 
I, th I think it's completely irresponsible, and it seemed like more of a game. All right, Mr. Burbrick. Yeah, look, I, I mean, it's dangerous, it's irresponsible, but it speaks to Aaron's uh, dishonesty and lack of integrity because he, he said uh, four, four months ago, early on in this, that he would vote against it. Uh, Again, the question that we received from reporters was not how would you vote, as Tim just asked, if you were the deciding vote. In that case, obviously you have to vote yes. That was that debt ceiling section where Aaron Regenberg was under attack from our debate uh, on Tuesday. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. Obviously, this signals, Ted, to voters that Regenberg is a perceived front runner as he came under attack. The question is, did it do any damage or was he able to weather the storm? Well, you know, I leave that to the voters to decide, but certainly his campaign didn't think that went well because they rushed out a statement immediately after the debate to all the reporters who were covering it, trying to restate more cleanly his position, which was, you know, I'd have voted no if it didn't matter <laughs> to yeah. protest things, but I would vote yes if it did matter. And as I, Dan McGowan wrote in The Globe the next morning, you know, for a lot of voters, he's basically, he's basically acknowledging, I wanted to grandstand on this. I didn't want, I knew what a responsible vote was, but if I didn't have to take it, I wanted to protest and leave it to Jack Reed and Sheldon Whitehouse and the others to, to take the yes vote that I, I agree was necessary if if it came down to me deciding. And Joe, like any broadcast event, um, you know, viewership can tend to go down. Right. This was right at the top. Right at the beginning, a key time when you're probably the largest audience. And again, the thing is, he did a sort of a flip-flop there, and that could hurt him. The problem that the uh, other candidates have is there's 10 other candidates. Yeah. So if he lose, say he lost one or two points, they're not going to go to one candidate. They're going to be divided among everybody. So it's going to hurt him some, I think, but probably not drastically. One this small thing I'd add, the only attack ad that I'm aware of as of this morning when we're taping on Friday is on this topic. It, it was in the works before that exchange because I think people have seen that they think that's a, that's an issue you can ding Aaron Regenberg at. And now it only reinforces that ad from that debate. Okay, we're going to take a break here on Newsmakers. When we come back, the power and problems with endorsements. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to the special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. This is Ted Nisi alongside Joe Fleming. We are bringing you key moments from our live televised debate in the congressional race from Tuesday night at Rhode Island College. And we that night asked them to respond to some criticisms that they have faced on the campaign trail. Here's that moment. Mr. Amo, the Working Families Party, a progressive group that backs Mr. Regenberg, blasted you in a memo to their supporters, pointing out that you took donations from lobbyists that, in their words, represent big pharma, big tobacco, big oil, and they warned voters to be wary of where your allegiances lie. Is the acceptance of these contributions a red flag to voters? It is, is not. I am the epitome of someone with a working family background. My dad owns a liquor store. He's probably watching this right now from that liquor store working the register. My mom is a nurse who's worked in nursing homes, a member of SEIU. So I'm not going to take the, the lecturing from folks who are supporting a candidate who has a $125,000 contribution from his father-in-law to a super PAC. That is a red flag. That is a clear red flag, especially because of the dishonesty that underlines it. And so what I would say is I am proud of the support that I've received uh, from a range of folks, and I will continue to make my case about why my background and why someone like me going to Congress would be so meaningful for people here in the first district. My family's come under attack a lot in the last few weeks uh, with some pretty wild and dishonest accusations. My in-laws made a in their personal capacity, a contribution to support someone they believe in, running on a platform that they believe in, Medicare for All, Green New Deal, and more. That's very different than contributions from corporate lobbyists. And let's be clear about that. Corporate lobbyists give contributions in their professional capacity in order to buy influence for their corporate clients. In, in Gabe's case, we're talking about Eli Lilly, the insulin profiteer. We're talking about big tobacco. We're talking about oil and gas companies. These are the very, these are the very interests Hang on one second. that are rigging our economy to raise costs, that are profiting off a broken healthcare system in the way that we just talked about. And I'm going to shift topics here to you, uh, Ms. Cano. Over the weekend, you initially accepted an endorsement from former Democratic candidate Don Carlson with seemingly no qualms, even though he exited the race after we revealed an inappropriate interaction he had with a student as a college professor. Ms. Matos criticized you for accepting the endorsement 
Hours later, you issued a second statement expressing concern about Carlson. Is that an acknowledgement that Ms. Matos was right and you should not have embraced the endorsement initially? So let me be clear, I didn't seek an endorsement and I always look at things with all the grounded facts instead of making judgment before I know a, a conclusion. And I did, in fact, the same thing with the um, controversy with Lieutenant Governor Matos, and that was specifically what I say there. I, I don't think no one here have all of the ground facts. Yes, it was concerning, and if we talk about abuse of power, that is what I called out. I was surprised to see her embrace that, um, that um, endorsement, especially in light of the accusations that has been made. As a mother, I'm concerned with those accusations. So I was very surprised to see her embrace that. 30 seconds, Senator. So thank you. I just want to say that it is very important that when we have sensitive information, we acknowledge it. But we also, as public elected officials, we need to be very careful about how we do things. And we don't use political points to advance in an issue. There is nothing that I have in this campaign as a scandal or a controversy. And it's going to be this kind of calling out on me because I supposedly took an endorsement that I didn't seek. That is really, really disappointing, Lieutenant Governor. Really. Okay, Ted, so we have scandals from the campaign trail that translated to attacks in our debate on Tuesday night. Um, I'm just wondering how many of those scandals and attacks sort of break through to voters. Well, I, I, you know, I, I hate to be a broken record, but as Joe has said too, with so many candidates and so many cross things firing, you know, you've got Sandra and Sabina fighting, you've got Aaron and Gabe fighting, you know, over a different set of things for the voters. It's like, okay, there's a Carlson endorsement scandal over here. There's a signature thing over here. There's a super PAC thing over here. There's a right. lobbyist money over here. That's a lot of things for the voters to keep track of. And there is almost no kind of paid reinforcement of this with attack ads. As I said, there's that debt limit attack ad against Aaron Regenberg. All these other things are really just playing out in the media, and I think it can become noise. But here's the thing to keep in mind. Many of the people watching the debate for the first time is the first time they've seen these candidates. Mm -hmm. They don't know these candidates. So some of these back and forths will give them an impression of that candidate, and they may base their decision who they're supporting on what they saw in the debate that night and a one-time shot of a candidate. All right, I want to uh, shift gears here, uh, Joe. A question for you. Earlier this week, Ted reported that uh, pro progressive Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, as right. she's famously known, backed Aaron Regenberg. Mm -hmm. Not a surprise, considering nope. the progressive con credentials there. Um, but you told me earlier, we were chatting about it, you said you actually think it could hurt Aaron Regenberg? Yeah, it could be a two-edged sword. Uh, one thing that's going to solidify his progressive vote, which I think he already had solidified with Bernie Sanders coming in last week. What it could do, though, is some of the people who were maybe thinking about voting for him might say, well, wait a minute, she is so liberal and so progressive, I don't want somebody that's so, that she supports. So they may go to another candidate. But again, with so many candidates, that vote could be divided. So I think it's a two-edged sword with that endorsement. And Joe says he, he didn't need it. Well, you know, I, I, I think that's a good point by Joe, that it's a branding. Luckily, as we keep talking about for Regenberg, he can have 70-something uh, percent of the voters pick someone else and still win. So mm -hmm. even if a lot of them are like, I don't know if I want the AOC candidate, it might be okay for him. Um, the, the flip side of it that I think about here is, you know, you see Patrick Kennedy endorsing uh, Gabe Amo. Yeah. There are so many people on the sidelines here. You know, Gina Raimondo, who Gabe Amo worked for, yes, she has has some restrictions in her current job. She might have been able to do something, because she did last year. Didn't see that. Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, Jack Reed, David Cicilline, Jim Langevin, Seth Magazine, or Dan McKee, all these important people did not endorse. Mm. So that's why we're looking to AOC, Patrick Kennedy, who doesn't even live in Rhode Island anymore, for big endorsements in this race. Well, 30 seconds, Joe. Some endorsements that might not make splashes like AOC, right. but can really help in campaigns. Sandra Cano has gotten some uh, support from labor. That's her whole strategy getting endorsements, labor. Uh, she got a lot of state representatives, a number of mayors and in the Black And why is that Valley. important? Explain. Because in an election like this, with a small turnout, a lot of it's grassroots. She doesn't have the money the other candidates have. So she's going to grassroots operation, and they're trying to identify voters and get them out on Tuesday to vote. It's a risky strategy. It's a narrow path, but it's a path that could work in the election when you have 12 people on the ballot. All right, we got to go to a break, but when we come back, sometimes it's hard to find differences with Democratic candidates. Ted was able to do that. <laughs> Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. <laughs>
Welcome back to a special edition of Newsmakers. We continue to bring key moments from our debate on Tuesday night, and we saw some differences from some of the Democratic candidates for Congress when Ted asked them about health care. Uh, Democrats in Congress of all stripes say they want Americans to have affordable health care. But there are real disagreements in the House Democratic Caucus over how to reach that goal. Some want a so-called Medicare for all, single-payer system with no private insurers. Others suggest creating a public insurer option which would compete with but not replace existing insurers. So I want to hear where all of you stand on that. Ms. Connell, I'll start with you. Do you support or oppose abolishing private health insurance and replacing it with a government-run health plan for everybody. I do think that we need to move into Medicare for all. Right now, health care is very expensive for Americans, especially for Rhode Islanders. I would say that my parents depend in health insurance every time. And the pharmaceuticals are really profiting on uh, people instead of saving lives. My dad takes a medicine that is called Revlimid, and I thought that it was uh, $10,000 a month. And now, I checked today, it was $25,000 a month. That's not about uh, saving lives. This is about making profit for corporations, and I am for a medical for all. I'm going to go to Mr. Regenberg. Do you support, I think I know the answer, but do you support abolishing private health insurance, moving to a government-run plan for insurance? Health care should be a fundamental human right for everyone. That's not how it currently works in this country. Right now, health care is an opportunity for corporations to profit off our injuries and illnesses. I'm proud to be the only candidate in this race who has an actual record of taking on big pharma and health insurance executives to push for Medicare for all. I fought for that every year I was in the General Assembly. I'm proud to be supported by folks like Senator Bernie Sanders, who was here uh, on Sunday to rally for our campaign, who's been leading this fight. I think pragmatically, we're not going to pass Medicare for all in one fell swoop. I think the way to do it is by lowering the Medicare eligibility age as, as far as we ha can when we have the political capital, maybe down to 55, then down to 50, down to 45. We're building the constituency of folks who are invested in this, who understand that this is this, this system helps them, and we'll be able to actually, I think it's, people right, I call bring, this a pipe dream. I, I'm all, I don't I'm think let it's everybody a pipe in on this, but I want to keep bringing people in. Ms. Matos, your position on this. My position is that we should have Medicare for all who wants it. If there is anyone that would like to have a different option, they can have the money to pay for a pension insurance, they can go for that. But we should have Medicare available for everyone. Everyone should have access to medical um, care. When you are trying to figure out how to pay your bills, and I can tell you, as someone that has a pre-existing condition, I'm so glad that we have the Obamacare in place. We have to strengthen the Obamacare, making sure that it's expanded to cover more people until we're able to have Medicare for all. Mr. Rama. I am in support of investing and in doubling down on the progress of the Affordable Care Act. One of the most proud moments I've had in my political career was helping on the implementation of the uh, ACA when I worked for President Obama, enrolling people in health insurance for the first time. But what I would say is we do need to be practical about the reforms that we might be able to achieve. I do think lowering the Medicare eligibility But the question age, is, do you support, not, do you support oh, yeah. or oppose abolishing private health insurance and moving yeah. to one government managed plan for I, I would not abolish uh, private health insurance. I would have a robust public option and look at the political realities that we face and try to get as much as we can to make sure that everybody has access to health care. Okay, gentlemen, let's uh, look ahead now. Joe, as of Friday morning, how many yeah. people have cast a ballot? Well, as of Friday morning, it was 9,052. Mm. 4,000 mail ballots and another 5,000 are early voting. Early voting ends on Friday at 5, four, 5 o'clock. The mail ballots can go in all the way up to Tuesday at 8 o'clock. There was a total of like 6,500 mail ballots applied for, but keep in mind, some of them are Republican ballots. Not that many, five or 600, even the early voting. A few of those people are Republicans also. Right. So the Democratic number is a little lower than it looks on the paper. All right, Ted, Tuesday night, what are you looking for? First and foremost, turnout is the turnout as low as some people think. Could it outperform? We want to see that. And then I'm watching the non-Regenberg candidates to see if one of them can pull it together to surpass him. Can Gabe Amo cut into him on the east side and the east bay, two places he's been working very hard? Can Sandra Cano outperform in places where she has key endorsements like Aquidneck Island or North Providence? And Sabina Matos, we know how much her campaign struggled since the signature scandal. How far did she fall? Or 
has she retained some residual strength that we are going to see that night? But it could also be that Aaron Regenberg is went into this month the front runner and sustained it. We are about to find out. Uh, Joe, five seconds based on these numbers. You still sticking around prediction, 30,000? I think somewhere between 30 and 40,000, saying all along. It could change, but right now it looks that way. And think about all that, right. Tim. 10,000 people might decide who the next congressperson is from Rhode Island for potentially a decade. That is wild. Uh, and a <laughs> reminder for everyone at home, uh, before next Tuesday's election. You can head to WPRI.com slash vote to get a full breakdown on all the candidates. And because not all the polling places will be open this time around, yours may be different. You can also find your polling place online. So Joe, Fle- uh, Joe Fleming, Ted Nisi, myself will be live we sure Tuesday will. <laughs> night yeah. yep. watching the numbers come in and eagerly awaiting your call. Good luck that <laughs> night, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. We'll see you next week.